Faye and Debbie, thank you for being here and thank you for your advocacy work, uh, more importantly. Um, I want to start our discussion by anchoring it within this recent wave of anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ uh, hate that we've been seeing emerging over the last few years. Um, you know, obviously people have faced discrimination for um, you know, their sexual and gender identities throughout history, but I think it's fair to say that we've been seeing something accelerate over the last year or two especially uh, that's been pretty unprecedented and like both in terms of its intensity but also uh, just in the way it's crossing lines in really serious ways and you know I'm thinking back to my own reporting with Press Progress over the last year or two where we've seen uh, really chaotic scenes at school board meetings, uh, you know, where you have people with various anti-LGBTQ type grievances who are showing up. Sometimes these are people who do not actually have kids uh, in these schools. They, some of them are not even parents. Uh, many come from out of town. Uh, we know some of them are connected to the Freedom Convoy or, you know, fringy far-right conspiracy groups. Uh, we've seen also these chaotic scenes at libraries where people are attempting to disrupt drag story time events. Uh, you know, also at schools themselves. I mean, here in Ottawa, we had a group of uh, anti-trans activists holding rallies outside three uh, schools, and it resulted in uh, you know kids as young as in kindergarten being ordered to shelter in place while these people were you know just kind of running amok in the streets. Um, yeah, and so like I've even reported on uh, you know national security officials who are paying closer attention to extremists with grievances about gender. We had the incident at uh, the University of Waterloo where you know a person came into a classroom and attacked people with a knife, and that's now being prosecuted under terrorism laws. Anyways, I could go on and on about this, but uh, you know I want to anchor the conversation in in you know this recent wave of hate that we've been seeing. So. Uh, Faye, you've been literally and figuratively on the front lines of this, uh, of this wave that we've been seeing. I want to start by asking you, uh, you know, what has this looked like for trans people in Canada, just on a personal level? Uh, where you're, like, what are you hearing from people in your community? Uh, that is a great question. And hi, Broadbent. How y'all doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, you know, I think I, I often say, um, like, we've made immense progress in the last, like, 30 to 40 years on the rights of queer and trans people. The world has changed. Uh, we have queer couples. We have marriage equality. We have uh, freedom to be ourselves to a degree uh, that we've never seen in contemporary Canadian history. Uh, but right now what we're seeing is, is the price that we pay for that progress, and that is a backlash. Um, you know, in the last year, we've seen three provinces rolling back on the rights of trans and gender diverse kids and their families. Uh, we're seeing staggering assaults on progressive movements under the guise of anti-trans hate. Uh, and all of that is leading to a community uh, that was never doing okay to begin with, right? Like trans folks are more likely to be poor, more likely to be working class, to be homeless, to be survivors of violence, uh, now having this whole machine of the far right stomping on them. And what that looks like in community is a lot lot of doom and gloom. A lot of folks who are worried, uh, both worried for their everyday survival, but also worried about how far this is going to go. Uh, and that's what keeps me up at night, is this is just the beginning uh, of a regressive movement uh, that is using new slogans and new tactics to radicalize Canadians, not just against queer and trans people, uh, but against gender and sexual diversity, against feminist values, against uh, the progressive movement writ large. And that is uh, a fight that we need to wake up to. Right, so I mean, Debbie, the trans community has obviously been the, you know, taking the main uh, brunt of this, uh, these attacks over the last few years, but we're also seeing the scope expand uh, to broader grievances about gender and sexuality, and the targets seem to keep multiplying. Um, you know, so I think some people might look at this stuff and think this might just be a trans issue and they fall out away in the part of their brain where, you know, this doesn't personally impact me, so they might not care as much. Can you spell why this is not just a trans issue? Excellent question. Oh, so <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, to contextualize it, like, I'm coming into this conversation as a black, cisgender, queer woman um, who is very much so invested in the protection of trans people in my community because it is, they're my community members, but it's also because of what else is at stake. And what else is at stake is the rights of all marginalized people. The unfortunate reality is that with where things are with public 
opinion and people's understanding of trans folks, it is very minimal, which makes them the prime target to punch on when really we're all being targeted. It is the goal right now is the regression of rights that are hard fought, that are LGBTQ legislation, it's feminist legis uh, legislation that protects the rights of women, but it's also your labor rights, it is rights of migrants, it is all of the things that push against the status quo. However, it is not popular to publicly punch black people, actually, depending on who you talk to, um, uh, that happens, but there are political consequences for that. I think what we're currently seeing right now with right-wing politicians across this country is that they haven't suffered the consequences politically to punch down on trans people, hence why that is why that group of people are being presented as the public face of what is a bigger, much more coordinated, much more well-resourced attack on trying to reverse all of the rights that we have fought on. And so that's what's happening right now. And, and if I can get in, just to, to, to zero in, because I think we, we think of that as like an abstraction a lot of the time. But you know, if we use Alberta as the case study, in Alberta, you've got a government that is putting itself between kids and the healthcare they need and normalizing government intervention to deny access to quote unquote controversial care. If we think that is anything other than a Trojan horse assault and abortion access and abortion rights, we are deluding ourselves. If we look at the assault on comprehensive sexuality education, that is an effort to force out education that helps people make informed decisions about their body, access evidence-based information, uh, and to navigate a diverse and changing world. If we look at their invocation of the notwithstanding clause in, in Saskatchewan and likely soon in Alberta, possibly in New Brunswick, that is normalizing overriding charter-protected rights. They might do it for trans kids, but they're coming for worker rights next. They're coming for women's rights next. They're coming for the rights of racialized communities next. It is so much more than just trans folks. But we don't notice and pay attention as much because it's about trans folks. So none of the premiers in uh, the provinces that you just mentioned, none of them ran on these issues. They've just kind of popped up out of the blue. What's your take on the politics behind uh, this sudden shift in, in focus? So in, in, in New Brunswick, it was a distraction from a premier dealing with cabinet crises. In Saskatchewan, it was a premier who was having his voters pulled away to an even further right party. In Alberta, it was a premier who has is probably the most precarious premier in this country, given that her predecessor was ousted by her own party. And she has an extremely organized social conservative base. And to Debbie's point, if she was to you know, come out of the gate and say, we're gonna f with, I'm sorry. We're going to mess with abortion access or we're going to screw with you know, anti-racism efforts. There would have been a condemnation. So she needed something that was salient to the public uh, that she could throw to those social conservatives. So all of this is cynical politicians using the public's lack of familiarity with trans people to score cheap points instead of delivering on the issues that Canadians care about, which is health care, jobs, housing, public education. Those are the priorities that most of us care about that we all align on, uh, but they're using these it, trans issues uh, to shore up support in a fringe and bring that fringe closer to the mainstream within a broader far-right agenda. Debbie, I have the same question, but I want to talk about uh, more in an education context. So, uh, you know, a lot of the people who are showing up to these um, school board meetings, they're focused on stuff like SOGI 123 and these inclusive, uh, you know, type type educational policies and programs. Um, wh where's this coming from? You know, wh where, why is there a sudden focus on these issues, uh, you know, at the school board level and at, on a more local level? Absolutely. So I'm a bit of a history nerd, so I feel I have to give the, like, history lesson, but then also what we are seeing right now in the contemporary sense. Um, but also tied to what Faye and I opened with in terms of, like, what's really happening right now. It, this is fascism, by the way, folks, like what we are seeing, and it becomes fascism when governments are given consent by the public, aka the people whom they want votes from, 
to have authoritarian responses to regress, regressing rights. So that's one thing I want to name. But that requires strategy and like work. And it also requires being extremely careful and clever with how you frame a particular issue. Like safety, for example, which is a key part of what the anxieties with inclusive policies we're seeing in schools. Um, the real quick history lesson that I wanted to give is that if we go back to the 60s and 70s, during a time after the Stonewall riots when LGBTQ rights um, were first being fought for in our, the contemporary sense, they have always been fought for since colonization of this land. Um, but people are familiar with like Anita Bryant and this woman country artist star who was presented as like the face of the movement of not wanting gay people to teach kids. It was an issue around morality and that the proximity of these kids to gay people were going to corrupt their morality. And having a white woman be the poster child of that was extremely strategic in getting more women to the side of people who were looking to entrench the status quo, which were obviously primarily white men who were social conservative, et cetera. Fast forward now, that same recruitment tactic is being used, uh, which again manufactures this consent that we're seeing conservative governments use by saying, oh, well, this is what people want. Look at the polling data. Um, please don't ever try to like use polling data to inform human rights, because that's not what we're supposed to do. Um, so what we're seeing with this idea of you know, the anxieties with schools and wanting to push back on this is meant to bring the movable middle to the other side. And for parents who, who is doing the most care work, it is mothers, it are, it's, those people are meant to be brought to that side. So that's the like, history lesson to the modern. But what actually is really happening, and I think this is more of a critique on what we should be doing better, and please don't fight me for this, um, we need to actually probably unpack what are some of the things that the other side is saying that might actually be true in terms of anxieties. And there are legitimate anxieties when it comes to the education system. Um, I graduated from the Dufferin Catholic Peel District School Board in 2010, um, and the same issues that my parents had struggles with trying to penetrate to understand as immigrant working class parents still exist today. So it's, it's true, parents want their kids to be safe in schools, parents want their kids to have an education, et cetera. Those anxieties still exist, but they're exasperated by so many things, the pandemic, cost of living, et cetera, and our schools become a, a melting pot of all of those issues. So these anxieties are legitimate, but what is the goal of the other side is to polarize us. And they're really good at polarizing us when they find the people who've been disenfranchised by the left. And it's these parents who, for whatever reason, could be xenophobia or racism, still don't really get to understand education because the language that's used isn't inaccessible. Um, you know, they're working nights, so they can never be part of a parent-teacher group, et cetera. Uh, these things still exist. And what the people who should be well positioned to do that education work, we actually aren't doing that. So who's, who comes in and goes, hey, it's the other side. And so what is true are those legitimate anxieties. What also is happening is these fabricated things that are whipped up from a, like a rhetoric perspective uh, to distract as Faye spoke to. So all of a sudden we're hearing now what is an anxiety and not un being under understanding what my kids are learning to, oh, by the way, teachers are trying to teach your kids how to have sex and uh, are trying to trans your kids, these things that we hear. If you are misinformed, if you have not been able to actually fully understand curricula in whatever province or territory you're in, yes, you are primed to be brought in and moved to the other side, which is why we're seeing all of this hysteria. You've all seen the images. If you live in Ottawa, some of us were probably at the counter protest last June uh, when, you know, far right folks were galvanized to protest out of a school here. These things are happening at the same time. So, there are things that are true that are creating anxieties for many people, and they're being exasperated by trying to survive a very chaotic world right now, but then there are also people who are very clever at mis like misinformation, and what we need to be doing is filling that gap by trying to inform folks and do public education work, which is historically what we have done before, so we gotta do that. 
So I guess picking up on hysteria and misinformation, Faye, uh, last fall, conservative leader Pierre Polyev delivered a speech in Richmond Hill uh, where he claimed Justin Trudeau is imposing, quote unquote, radical gender ideology uh, on children in Canadian schools. Uh, I talked to you for that story. I also spoke with the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, Anti-Defamation League in the United States, Human Rights Watch. All of them told me that this gender ideology rhetoric is basically a conspiracy and, you know, what this all boils down to is this idea that, you know, schools are trying to turn kids gay and trans, basically. Um, but my question isn't about Polyev, it's actually about the media coverage because with that specific incident, uh, other than Press Progress and, you know, to their credit, CBC Power and Politics picked it up, Rachel Gilmour did uh, some stuff on it as well. Um, you know, the rest of the media basically gave Polyev a pass. So my question to you is, first of all, like, why is it hard for, you know, the media to wrap their heads around these issues, but also, you know, what is the impact on people in your community when those kinds of comments get ignored? It, it, it's dangerous, right? Like, on, on a simple level, I think, you know, media is still generally a whole, no shade to straight folks, is a whole bunch of straight folks and, like, three gay people. Uh, we have one trans journalist in Quebec. You heard from her a second ago. Would be great if we had some more. Um, but there is, there isn't literacy. And I think a lot of us, it, I have the same issue with, with media to a certain extent that I do with a lot of progressive movements in this response is that we have a value alignment. We say trans rights are human rights and, and we, we leave it there. And so we don't often have deeper literacy to unpack and respond to the disinformation. And so our response is, you know, parents don't have rights, they have responsibilities. If you're a Muslim mom or a newcomer mom and you're worried about your kid, you say that that parent doesn't have rights and you've just you know, sent somebody right down that dangerous pipeline to a much scarier place. And so our response, our literacy to see through the disinformation uh, isn't what it should be. Um, we get bogged down in details instead of doing what we should be doing, which is speaking up for schools where, where, where whether you're a gay kid, a trans kid, a poor kid or a disabled kid, you have the freedom to be yourself, you're safe in your classrooms and you're treated with dignity. And to get further on this, I do think we need to stop, media needs to stop parroting the talking points of Polyev. You don't have to cover uh, his horrible comments about gender ideology with a headline about parental rights. You can talk about um, you know, anti-trans or anti-LGBT or anti-freedom. And that is actually what these policies are. They are denying kids the freedom to be themselves. But when you parrot the parental rights stuff, as most outlets are doing, you're playing the far rights game for them. So something you sometimes hear from people in political circles is that these right-wing culture war issues are uh, you know, designed to divide working class movements and so the argument goes that you, know, you should just you know, not give it oxygen, just ignore it, you're getting kind of, uh, you know, it's basically all just a distraction from meat and potato economic issues. But on the flip side, if you did that, you know, you would basically be abandoning vulnerable communities. And in some cases, you know, these are quite literally life or death situations, right? Um, anyway, so my question to you is, you know, how do you reconcile this question? Um, you know, like how do you, you know, how do you avoid getting dragged into this sort of, you know, culture war uh, trap uh, without abandoning vulnerable communities? Or is this the whole framing, you know, just the wrong way of looking at it? Uh, so, you know, I think first and foremost, uh, this isn't just about trans people and the assault on our rights is we're just a convenient target. We're a scapegoat. Again, it's about worker rights. It's about women's rights. It's about the rights of racialized communities. And we need to understand that they're playing a game by using the culture war stuff to set the stage for a broader assault on the rights of marginalized and working class Canadians. Um, my second piece is like, we need to tap into this because they're putting the money into the opposition side of it. Uh, the response isn't to just cede territory to the far right. Where are we going to be if we do that? They already dominate, unfortunately, on many, uh, on many economic issues. We win often on the social issues. And so if we cede that space, we're going to have to fight like hell to get it back. Uh, and this is your workers. These are your kids. These are your friends. Uh, if this hate continues, Already in the fall, I'm expecting Albertan families to have to leave that province because they're not going to be able to access the health care that their trans kids need. 
Um, if we seed space here, we will see more homeless people, more trans kids kicked out of their homes. We will therefore see greater demand on our housing sector, on our homeless shelters, greater demand on our emergency rooms. The social issues are tied to the economic issues, and we cannot seed space because lives will be lost, uh, opportunities will be curtailed, and a whole generation of queer and trans people that are literally just beginning to raise our heads and walk tall in spaces like these are going to be shoved back into the closet after we were told that these movements we're our pals and would always fight with us. So there is no option here. This is not just about trans people and we need the full progressive left to wake up because my folks are fighting this fight and we are losing. I want to shift to talking about the threat to public education specifically. Debbie, you've argued that the far right is trying to politicize uh, public education and trying to turn schools into kind of a culture war arena. Um, I guess, you know, two questions here. So first of all, like, what are you hearing from educators and school boards and teachers unions about what they're seeing in classrooms and on the ground? Uh, and then also, you know, to what extent is some of the harassment that we've already been talking about uh, and some of the, you know, like in some cases, these are presenting real workplace safety issues. You know, to what extent is this a, uh, you know, a labor issue? Great question. Uh, and I'll start off by adding to what Faye mentioned with regards to people seeing uh, this is unrelated to like labor at all. And I would just tell folks who work in the labor movement, you need to connect the, not, the dots. Like you need to be able to connect what's happening with your workers to what's happening to people who you might not immediately think are like the first point of contact for the issues you're working on. Um, and to honestly listen to the sh issues that workers are dealing with and use that as the entry point to share the story and the narrative of why are all of our issues are connected. And so when it comes to education, um, what I'm hearing, and I've been fortunate enough to speak to school boards and teachers unions around what they're hearing, what they're dealing with, what they're facing. And right now, what we're seeing is an interesting dynamic, which I think is an indication of the success of the other side being able to set a trap for many of us who are doing this work. And what I am seeing right now, uh, which have been told to us, and I'll just say it plainly, that we have primarily you know, well-meaning white teachers who are afraid to uh, call out discrimination against LGBTQ people in their classrooms because they do not want to be seen as racist. I, at first when I heard that, I was like, what? But then I'm like, you know what? That's because of the trap that has been set with the things like parental rights um, and this idea of wanting to be a very good person and not wanting to step on toes. Um, and what happens when issues from one side and the other are seen as opposed to each other. And so what's happening is we have a lot of afraid teachers. They're afraid. And they're afraid to want to uphold things like inclusion on LGBTQ because they're fearful of what reaction they're gonna get. And if you're someone who's chronically online like I am, you will have probably seen some of the, targets, the targeted online attacks on teachers whose names, schools, et cetera, have been put online, mainly because they have had small signals to showcase that they support all of their students. But it's the support for LGBTQ students that becomes weaponized as you're indoctrinating, et cetera. So there's this fear that these teachers are facing. Where it becomes a labor issue is very much so connected to what I just said. And this has been something that I've been telling teachers unions and school boards about what they're facing and what tools they have in front of them to be able to uh, plant two flowers with one seed that I like to use as opposed to the more violent analogy. You can use the tactics of labor to actually play the long game of solidarity with LGBTQ people. And it's not even just solidarity. It is just, again, wanting to protect the rights of all people. And you can start with your rights as a worker. That the conditions that have been created as a result of this polarization are making it unsafe for you. You are at the front line of what is a melting pot of world issues. And teachers are being targeted because people are seeing that supportive adults need to be taken down. 
And so that's how you could actually use your collective bargaining process to maybe fight for things that ensure that you're protected. But then while simultaneously holding your school boards accountable for some of the distracting policy BS that we see, whether this is a school board who's distracted by trustees who want to fly a pro-abortion flag, but then using that as part of the rhetoric to be like, this is why we can't fly an LGBTQ one, those school boards have a right to ensure that you are safe as a worker. And when they are distracted with these cultural things, that takes away from your ability to show up to ensure safe schools are there for these students. So while your classrooms are overflowed with students, while uh, teachers are quitting the field because they aren't getting well funded, you are best positioned to use the space you're in at workers to actually bring the story and drive the story home to ensure that you're protected, but also all students, which is actually the real thing. That's the anxiety that people are really talking about, is just that we have people who are utilizing problematic tactics to distract from the real issues. And so, yeah, use your workers' rights, folks. So, Critics are often framing their criticisms of these, you know, s inclusive school pro uh, policies and programs as, uh, you know, being about parental authority or parental rights. Um, let's talk about this rhetoric because it seems to me that this is zeroing in on, you know, anxieties about the breakdown of the traditional family and the breakdown of gender roles. Uh, you know, wh who's this rhetoric really targeting and what is it trying to do? And obviously, why is it problematic? So like baseline is we all believe in safe schools. We all believe in schools where kids are healthy, happy, and thriving. And we also all believe that parents should be as actively involved as possible in the lives of their kids because that leads to healthy, happy, thriving young people. Uh, what this rhetoric does uh, is it, it insinuates a few things. One, uh, it insinuates, uh, underpinning it is the idea that teachers are hiding something, that there's something scary or devious. Uh, and Second, it's a trap, because it means that we say parents don't have rights, they have responsibilities. If you tell a parent that, you are furthering a divide that doesn't serve any of us. And so it is this, you know, it's ironic, because if you look at the school policies, you know, Saskatchewan passed a parent bill of rights that wasn't about strengthening parental roles in local school boards or in education curricula, um, or their role in every other aspect of their kids' education. It was literally like, we're gonna use this slogan, and then, no one's going to notice that the policies are literally just about the trans kids. Uh, and so it also it clouds the conversation. You know, I believe in responsible government and sound public policy. If you have that, that means you chat with teachers, you chat with young folks, you chat with parents to develop interventions. We had policies that were nuanced policies that will encourage uh, and gave young folks the freedom to be themselves, uh, that encourage parent involvement, uh, that made sure that we were ready if there were situations where a young person was at risk. But every teacher's ideal outcome when a kiddo comes out as trans is that that kid is out at school and at home because that leads to a happier, healthier child. But again, it packages this, you know, it sets a trap where we say, no, there's no such thing as parent rights. And that just fuels more of the radicalization, more of the misinformation. And they pair this with all of these like false narratives about what's happening in schools. Believe it or not, like the reason we ra raise a pride flag isn't because we're pushing any kind of gay agenda. The reason we raise a pride flag is the same reason that schools participate in Ramadan. It is to show Muslim kids, to show gay kids, in both of those situations, that they deserve to be seen safe and supported at school. And we, yeah, I'll leave it there. So I know, uh, you know, Momentum has done some interesting research into best practices when it comes to, you know, how to communicate with these issues and, you know, try to bring more people on side. Uh, you know, how do you approach people who are being won over by this rhetoric or misled by misinformation? You know, what are some of the insights that you've um, been able to figure out through this kind of research? So my biggest advice is like, I love, I, I use the term the gays to talk about queer and trans communities. I am trans, you cannot come for me, and you also can't say it, so it's fine. Sorry. Uh, no, but I, what I would say is my folks come in with our fists up, and we have a good reason to, right? Like, queer and trans folks are scared in this moment. We are worried, we're seeing regression, uh, and we are used to governments and society punching down on us. This is not the time for us to go in with our fists up. 
in response to misinformation and disinformation, particularly when it is trying to pit our sibling movements and pals against each other, we need to connect on shared values. Again, we all agree that students deserve the freedom to be themselves, to be safe at school, and to learn about respecting a different kind of world than generations before. So we connect on shared values. We also validate anxieties. I know that you as a parent are passionate and invested in your child's education, and I'm actually excited to have this conversation with you. Now at the same time, I think there's a lot being said in the social sphere about what's happening in our schools, and I'd like to take some time to have a conversation with you about that. And then you pair it into there are folks out there who are lying about what's happening in our classrooms and who aren't doing it in the best interest of you or your family or your kids. They're doing it because they want you to be angry. They want you to be distracted because when you're distracted, you don't notice that they keep cutting our school budgets. They don't, you don't notice that your kid can't get access to a family physician without a, a three year wait list. And so we have to engage, we have to extend an olive branch and have these kinds of conversations. On my Instagram, I will call the bad guys all kinds of bad things. When I'm in community, when I'm navigating these kinds of conversations, we need to be the ones who are reasonable and who are ready for the discussion because I actually believe in the power of our ideas. Our policies are the right policies for all of our families, but we're not having those conversations. And part of it is because we need our allies to be having those conversations. I am not the right ambassador for half of the times that I'm in the media rambling about queer stuff. I want a dad from rural Alberta with a 15-year-old kid saying, do not put your government between my kid and his health care. Do not make my kid's life harder in school. We do not have an even playing field because I look a little bit different than most people expect. And so if y'all are having those conversations, it takes a poisoned environment and brings it back to a mature adult conversation in the best interest of our kids and all our families. So, you know, a lot of this stuff... Yeah, sorry. Debbie, a lot of this stuff is being driven, we know, by stuff that's online. Um, and, you know, in some cases that stuff is quite literally radicalizing people and inciting real-world violence. Um, and it does seem like we're all kind of struggling about, you know, how to figure this stuff out. I mean, the federal government is currently proposing online harms legislation. Uh, but where do you think the emphasis needs to be when we're thinking about this problem and, like, the online kind of component to it? Yeah, I think on the online piece, I think there's there, that we're still trying to figure it out. And I think that this is a collective thing that we need to address. Because I think what feels good in the short term, especially when these policies come in and it feels like it's in response to the far right, we're like, yes, they've done it. This is going to protect us, especially for the internet making things worse. What we fail to look into in the long term is how that is going to be weaponized against our movements because we've seen that happen. Um, this could be, uh, you know, anxieties that some people had around the use of the Emergency Measures Act during the convoy. Um, I was very much so entrenched on looking at what was happening, but my immediate thought was, folks, this is absolutely going to be used against us at some point. Um, and I was a couple of weeks ago at a press conference for Horizon Ottawa, which is a municipal progressive organization here, shout out if they're here, um, around um, bylaw against megaphones at protests, which again, in the short term, we see it as something that is in response to far-right actions with the convoy. But what ended up happening was... Uh, Palestinian protesters were the ones getting bylaw tickets. Um, folks who were advocating for LGBTQ rights were getting bylaw tickets. And so we're still trying to figure out the thing on the online side. I think it's just really important for us to think critically about the long-term game and how exactly we should be pushing for government to make changes in laws and recognizing that, yes, what feels good immediately is something that will be responding to far-right action will absolutely be weaponized against our movements too. So what other options should we be looking at? That's something that I would want people to give a thought to. Um, so, you know, last fall, Faye, there was the Million Man March for Children uh, in cities across Canada. It was supposed to be about ch uh, protecting children from, uh, you know, the, the gender ideology in schools. 
Um, you know, in that case, we actually saw quite a large union presence on, uh, you know, in the streets in Ottawa. Uh, there were, you know, prominent political leaders who were marching in Parliament Hill. And it, I mean, this, this million uh, March for Children thing was happening in a number of cities across Canada. And, uh, you know, in some cases, the counter protesters actually outnumbered the, uh, you know, the people participating in this march. And actually, there's this great video of one of them who's just freaking out because he's been surrounded by, you know, all the counter protesters and sort of freaking out. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what is the value in getting bodies into the streets and showing mass solidarity, uh, you know, in the face of these sort of far right attacks? This is where I struggle. Um, I actually wish if I had been able to, all of those lovely months ago, I wish that we hadn't done it. Uh, I wish we had not counter protested. I wish we'd all issued a press release that said, we're not gonna go hang out with some wackos in a park. They're not worth our time. We're focused on a more free, equal, and socially just future. We're not gonna go and meet these folks. I think we have an instinct to like go and fight the fascists. Uh, we don't need to go and fight the fascists right on that line. Sometimes we do. What we need to do is we need to win, to win hearts and minds and push good policy forward that delivers for, again, all of our families. And so I, I think I understand why we did that. I think it largely like, needed to happen, and it happened really organically, which was incredible to see. Um, but in Ottawa, a lot of the folks on the opposition side were Muslim moms worried about their kids. The last thing that I need is a 21-year-old gay person with a side shave and blue hair, sorry, I was that, uh, <laughs> yelling at a Muslim mom. That breaks all of the things that we're trying to achieve here because our movements need to be united for, again, a more free and equal Canada. And so I think my struggle is we aren't always as strategic as I would like us to be. And that's true in my space. That's also, I think, true in some of these spaces. Uh, and so we often take their bait instead of saying, why are we meeting them where they're at? Why don't we go over that way? And if we go over that way, they're going to be over there and we're going to keep winning. They wouldn't have got, we gave them headlines across the freaking country uh, because of these counter demos. And their narrative was save the kids. And we said, no, that doesn't win anybody over. And so it is that we need a better message. Uh, we need to be strategic with our resources because they've got bigger, but deeper pockets than we do. And so if we're going to organize, let's organize not just to stop something, but to push for something better. So last question, um, the title of this panel is Uniting Queer, Trans and Labor Movements Against the Far Right. We have a room full of labor leaders and labor activists. Uh, my question to you is how can the labor movement best protect trans kids and support your communities? I'll start off and um, I think it's in the title on like movement and movement building and that should be the priority because it forces us to what Faye mentioned, to be strategic. And it forces us from moving away from what we've been doing, which is responding to the right, which is exactly, again, the trap that is being set up for us. By movement building and being strategic, we're thinking about the long game. We're thinking about using uh, historical tools within the labor movement that have been proven to win, but also re readjusting for the current context that we're in right now. And so this is an excellent opportunity for folks to come together and to strategize and to figure out what is the thing that we need to do now going forward to play the long game. Because you know who's really good at doing that? The far right. Um, not to say that we should be mimicking their tactics, but movement building has historically been the thing that got us our, our rights to begin with. And movement building is going to be the thing that allows us to push back against all of what is happening and to actually create the good society that we actually want at the end of the day. And so for labor that's here, honestly folks, class is the thing that we're really good at talking about but also forgetting. Um, and the anxieties that people are feeling right now are legitimate. And when we are not good at responding to those anxieties, it allows every one of those people to feel disenfranchised and to look at the options that are being created by the other side as common sense, where we've heard that before, and that's what pulls them to that other side. We need to do a good job at responding to what people's anxieties are and using that as the entry point to talk about why it is a common struggle. Like that is your entry point. You're anxious because your employer won't increase your wages 
changes, I hear you on that. And that is also why having fascist governments that are authoritarian aren't going to change things. It's actually going to make things work. So how do we work together in building a movement? It's actually being really good, like, community members and really not forgetting about class in all of this and labor. That is your shtick. Go right into it and I promise you we're going to build the world that we want. I have a list. <laughs> So I think, like, to, to contextualize, like, my, my job, I, my, my nonprofit is Society of Queer Momentum. Our role is to do the movement building, the people, power, and the politics. So when New Brunswick happened, we connected all the New Brunswick queer organizations and helped mobilize there. We did the same thing in Saskatchewan. We're there in Alberta today. We're creating the tools. We're helping m massage that message and help a whole new generation of queer and trans advocates tap into a fight like we haven't had for over 20 years. What that means in practice when it comes to labor is we need support. Uh, we need support on a numbers game. We need bodies on the ground ready to mobilize and making this an issue. I want a future where no government and no party and no politician messes with the rights and freedoms of any of our communities. And we need to learn how to do that on this issue. We need to draw a line on this in the sand in Alberta because if we let them win there, it's gonna jump back to New Brunswick and get worse. It's gonna jump again to Saskatchewan. Any conservative government that comes along will use this to bring forward an anti-worker, anti-woman, anti-race, anti-everybody agenda. And my sector is not ready for this fight. Uh, the queer and trans movement has made immense progress in the last 20 years. But many of our organizations, for very good reasons, are now predominantly government-funded entities that's focus is delivering programs and services. That is incredible, because it means we're meeting the needs of folks on the front, on the ground, in communities. The homeless gay kid has somebody they can call. What we do not have is the resources, expertise, to fight these kinds of political and public opinion battles. Labor has those skills. Labor has those skills. Labor has been fighting and never stopped fighting because you always have to deal with bad bosses taking the most money they can from your pockets and putting it right back in theirs. And so my invitation to labor is recognize that this is an existential threat to progressive causes and isn't just a time for a solidarity, cute, wholesome statement, but to activate and fight this fight because this is the tip of a spear that Polyev is going to ride all the way to office. He's going to use it to remove everything woke, which is literally everything gay, everything black, everything my diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm not I'm almost done. And so my asks are first, um, my organization is planning a big gay rainbow week of action from May 11th to 17th. <laughs> It is not us counter-protesting. It is us showing that we will bring people out in every single city, town, and community to speak up for rainbow equality and a more free and equal future. If you are a labor organizer, I want you to take out your phone. Come on. Take out your phone. Go to a type of, open your email app. You're going to send me an email. F-A-E at MomentumCanada.net. And all I want you to do in that email body is say, here's my name, here's my org, happy to help. I want my phone to be buzzing because in about one week, we're unveiling all of the confirmed rallies, our centralized website, and I need tens of thousands of people taking action across this country. So that's ask number one. Ask number two, follow us on social media, Career Momentum. Ask number three is, I need to build a war chest. And this is the, the tricky ask. I don't like talking about money, but y'all, it is what you got to do. The queer space has almost no money to play the political and advocacy game. If we had been ready in New Brunswick, if we'd had the right ad, the right message, and the bodies on the ground, we could have stopped this darn thing in its tracks. We were not there. My team's job is to be the war room for the gays. And we are ready to throw all of the mud to also build all of the coalitions, and labor is already in there with us on that fight. But we need to bring it to scale, because if we do not get ourselves ready for the next election, 
we're going to have an election where Polyev stomps over trans people, and he's going to have polls that show it's popular to do so. And that will make it easier for him to get elected, to distract us with gender woo-woo, while he brings forward an agenda that hurts our workers. And so my ask and call to action is step in, step up, help us fight this fight, because we can win it, we can stop this culture war BS, and we can get back to delivering for all of our families. Thank you. Debbie, would you like to say any words about uh, how people can help to uh, find out more and support the work of the Canadian Center for uh, gender and sexual diversity. Yes, I was like, are we concluded? I was like, Faye, you had like a nice punch there. I was yeah. like, we can end it there. But yes, uh, the organization I work for works uh, in support of 2 LGBTQ youth from coast to coast to coast. And we are doing this work in school communities across the country. I know there's a, a large teacher union presence that's here. Take a look at our website, which is ccgsd.org, uh, ccgsd-ccdgs.org, um, and support our work by inviting us to your classroom by donating, but then also amplifying some of the advocacy messaging we have that is youth-led and youth-driven. So keep it short and simple. That's how you can support us. Um, and yes, we can't wait to fight the good fight with you. You can say one more thing. You got Sorry, this. I'm bad at stopping. Um, what, I, what I really like, I, I don't think if folks fully understand how tired the queer folks in this fight are right now. Uh, I have had to have security on me. I have had death threats. Every single darn month, there is a far-right article coming for me and coming for my friends. I, we have told, like, we have changed the world for a whole generation of queer and trans people. And we've told the young folks that they can be whoever they need to be, whoever they know themselves to be. And they can feel that space constricting. And it, like, I am so scared to see, like, these kids are going to be hurting after we've told them it's okay to be you and that you should have the freedom to be yourselves. And so I think strategically it's the right thing to do to tap in. Politically it's the necessary thing to do. But Lord Jesus, come to bat for those kids because they need adults in the room to fight this fight for them today. Faye and Debbie, thank you so much for talking thank to me Thank you today. for having us.